Hello, and welcome to another episode of Wither the Luniversity, the podcast of the Peerless Review. Uh, a few weeks ago, I asked some listeners on social media who they would like uh, to uh, have on the show, who they'd like to hear from, and um, Dr. Pedro Domingos was was good enough to respond to it. He was sort of the, the top vote getter. He's with me today. Uh, he is Professor Emeritus at the Paul G. Allen School of Computer Science and Engineering, the University of Washington. He's an expert in machine learning, artificial intelligence, data mining, um, and other sub areas of expertise. He's a fellow at the American Association for the Advancement of Science, uh, author of many peer reviewed articles, dozens, n author of a number of books, most recently, The Master Algorithm How the Quest for the Ultimate Learning Machine Will Remake the World. This is a terrifying title to me. Um, hopefully that he, he, he will uh, set my mind at ease a bit. Dr. Domingos, welcome. Thanks for having me. Uh, so I ask this of everybody. Uh, you are in an interesting field and one that is remaking society, uh, computer engineering and specifically machine learning and artificial intelligence. Tell us how you got into this this field, you know, as a young man, um, what attracted you to this? Uh, uh, what were the the fortuitous um, events that that brought you to where you are now? Well, as a teenager, when I had to pick a major, uh, I, I thought long and hard about it because I liked everything. That was my problem. Uh, but after a lot of research, I concluded that the best path was to go into engineering not necessarily because engineering would be what I wanted to do in the long term, because, and lots of people from different fields told me this, if you go into science or engineering, the door stays open to go into anything else. If you're going to say the humanities, it's a, it's a, you know, a one-way door. You're never going to you know, pick up the math and et cetera. So I was like, I, I want to keep my options open. Uh, and then initially I picked electrical engineering, but then Luckily for me, in like my my like second year of, of undergrad, this was in the 80s, the computer science specialization was started in, in the school that I was in, 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 in Portugal. And I immediately, at that point, I said like, oh, computer science is the thing for me. And why? For two reasons. One is clearly there was going to be enormous impact. And the second is that like it, it gives so much room for creativity. It's really a unique field. It's like a programmer is like a little god. You can create the universes that you want. You can your imagination and computational cost are really the only two limits. And you know, those actually are serious limits, but I just I was very, you know, seduced by this. And then in particular, in my, you know, like last year of undergrad, I saw this book in a bookstore called Artificial Intelligence. And I was like, what could that be? Right? It's like it seemed almost like an oxymoron. So I read the book. And I, you know, I got the picture, uh, but but the key thing was that this was in the 80s and back then, like machine learning was completely, you know, abandoned, if you will. Nobody cared about it. Nobody thought it had much of a future. But there was a chapter in the book on machine learning. And I was struck by two things. One was, wow, the potential of this, right? If you can do machine learning for real, you will change not just one field, but every field. So, you know, I've always wanted to have impact. And, and I was like, this is, you know, the road to mega impact, if we can do it. The other side of it, it was that the state of the art was so primitive. It was like the algorithms that they were talking about, there were a joke. And some people might think like, well, you know, that's a bad sign. But on the contrary, right? You know, it's better than going to physics or biology that are pretty darn mature. So you see a field with enormous potential, but it's very immature. So I decided to get a PhD in machine learning. And back then I used to tell people, you know, machine learning is going to change the world. And, and people would be like, whatever. And now, you know, now I get to gloat. <laughs> so I'm curious, at that time, when you made this decision and you imagined, say, 40, 30, 40 years on, um, has the impact that these technologies have had exceeded what you imagined we would be at this point? Or... Or did it fall short of what you had imagined or about what you imagined? It's been less in some ways and more in others. It's been different, right? So the the AI, real AI, is closer now, but it's still very far. 
right? But I, I, it was very clear in my mind by the time I made this call, which was the early 90s. This was in the middle of the AI winter. I got into AI in the middle of the AI winter, so there was no illusion that AI was coming anytime soon, right? And, and from that point of view, you know, we're still a long way away, but we've made remarkable progress, less than we expected in some things, more in others. But in terms of impacting the world, it's again, it varies a lot by area. Some things haven't happened, but a lot of things that I wasn't, or I think anybody was thinking about have happened. And it's just a different, it's one thing to think, you know, it's like Bill Gates said, like, oh, you know, we thought we knew that one day there'll be a PC on every desktop, but they had no idea how the full consequences of that would be because no one can imagine. And it's the same thing that's happening with, with AI today. Like I couldn't have, if, if somebody asked me then to make a list of areas where AI will have a big impact, you know, I would have made 20, but now there's 2000. In fact, they often tell students, you know, like go to the Bureau of Labor Statistics list of occupations. There's tens of thousands of them and find me one that is not affected by machine learning, right? That's that's how pervasive it, it is or going or is going to be. Well, I do want to talk to you a little bit about that because I expect that uh, the university, as we understand it today, as an institution, will will undergo some profound changes in the next uh, 20 or 30 years. Um, but first, uh, some listeners may be familiar uh, with um, some uh, an episode that recently gained you some, some attention. Um, Team Neat Gabru, uh, who was a, a person who I think is pretty high up in Google, um, I think that the origin of this, and correct me if I'm wrong, was uh, when she she published her paper with a number of co-authors called "On the Dangers of Stochastic Parrots." Um, and and if I'm wrong, like because this is not my area of expertise, correct me. But I think that the the gist of of this paper is um, there's large language models and in artificial intelligence. The idea is, is to run as many texts through this as you can. Um, so, you know, billions, I, I would assume, billions of texts, so that essentially um, the the computer can can communicate in short. And now we, we're not talking about agency or anything like that here, but it can mimic human communication. And the idea was that if you don't curate the language that goes into the process of teaching this to communicate that certain forms of bias or or prejudice may be perpetuated um and so the idea is that in making these very large language models that uh human researchers or or engineers need to make sure that it's only getting sort of approved discourse um is that right is that a fair account of that before i continue I think what you said is accurate. It is, you know, you've talked about one aspect of the paper, one of the main ones. That paper and, you know, the controversy around it are only one aspect of the larger phenomenon of what you might say, you know, is wokeism invading AI, right? Which has been very interesting to observe. That paper gained notoriety not because of its content, but because of the of the brouhaha that ensued. Uh, because so she 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 and someone else were co heads of of um, you know a, a machine learning ethics group at Google. Actually, not that high up, you know. It, it was it was you know there were several layers of management between her and and Jeff Dean, who is a top person at AI, and she decided to you know make <laughs> a bugbear of. Poor guy. I know him. Sounds like well. she threatened to resign, and uh, then they said, "Well, you know, do, you know, bye." <laughs> yes, exactly. And you know, to this day, there's a, a a controversy as to whether she resigned was was fired. Right? Some people say she was resigned. I think she, she, some people say she was resigned, and some people say she resigned. Right? And of course, she's she. But but uh, so a lot of this is stuff that went on inside Google. But people actually, the public actually has the main facts. What has been sad is that the mainstream media just bought her story, which is full of, you know, falsehoods, frankly. And, and the, you know, people like Jeff Dean, you know, he couldn't talk, right? So, so th th this one, up, and also the environment was conducive to, you know, turning people like her into martyrs of the cause when in fact there's something else entirely. So, so there was that big, so, so the fact that she quit or was fired 
and this was, you know, surprisingly widely covered in the media, made made that paper famous. That paper is an almost a caricature of of the themes of wokeism as applied to AI. Right? There was this guy Michael Lissack uh, who actually took the time to write a, a a really thoughtful analysis of all. He made a list of the implicit assumptions in that paper and why they were problematic. <laughs> So I mean, like I, I, you know, I really value somebody actually doing that as opposed to you know, here's another tweet, mm -hmm. and 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 you can read that and see just what is wrong with the paper better than you know than than I could say in 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 one minute. Um, but their reaction to him was to hound him, and to say that he was harassing them and like I mean, people like Timothy Gebru are very good at playing the victim, right? It's the you know the you know what is it called the cry bullies. Right. Well, it is the uh, the currency of the uh, culture of corporate and academic advancement at this point. Yes, and it gets you. So, for example, something that a lot of people don't know, but I've heard from more than one source at Google, is that she was infamous for every time someone disagreed with her, she would yell racist and the other person would back down, including people very high up. So you actually, you know... When you get to play that card, you can actually dictate all sorts of things that you shouldn't be able to. And in fact, what a lot of the media missed, you know, and some some of them dug deeper, but unfortunately, even those, you know, the better journalists, of course, this didn't really come out that much. Uh, and partly it's because, you know, the, the people weren't talking is what happened there was, and maybe you can tell this, that was just the tip of the iceberg. It was this, that thing was the straw that broke the camel's back, right? She kept demanding things, demanding, demanding, right? You know, like, you know, I demand that you Google do what I say, or you are racist and blah, blah, blah. And then finally, right, apropos of that paper, you know, and let's, you know, the details are interesting, but 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 maybe not the, not the key point here. She said like, well, here's my list of demands, right? You are going to do A, B, C, D, or I resign. And Google said, okay. In fact, what I what I think Google's, you know, I'm not I don't want to put, you know, thoughts in their minds, but like my my guess is that when they saw it, it was like, yes, <laughs> <laughs> she's leaving. Because if they fired her, right, then they would be completely justified. Any company would be justified in firing, you know, an employee from hell like her. But they were, of course, afraid of the backlash, right? That's the world that we live in. And then she handed it to them on a plate. She said, if you don't do this, I will resign. Things that they had no intention of doing anyway. So they were like, All right, okay, bye. <laughs> and then she went like for like months on end on a campaign of Danny. I mean, Jeff Dean is a very prominent computer scientist, right? He's the guy who actually started the whole large scale data center computing stuff that we all take advantage of today right uh, so you know this is a, and, and he's a good guy right and he's you know he's he's kind of woke you know like nobody's perfect but he hired her right on on very good intentions and i you know at the time of us uh, some of them warned him and, and and then they're like and like you're making a mistake this is gonna blow up in your face right it's like blow it's like imagine exxon mobile hiring a bunch of anti-fossil fuel activists <laughs> right you think this is going to have a happy ending? Well, it didn't. So then she went for months on this campaign of denigrating Jeff Dean in public. And he never replied, which, you know, which must have been painful for him. But like, probably, even the wise, people on, probably wise, yeah. But even the people on her side were saying like, okay, you know, enough, let it go. But, you know, that's uh, that was one episode. There, there have been many episodes like this involving various kinds of, of people. So you push <laughs> back a little bit on this um, on Twitter and in other places. And um, you were richly rewarded uh, for for your efforts. But what really interested me was and, and I've looked at the tweets and such. I mean, you know, there, there were some barbs, but uh, no, you know, I mean, people can throw barbs. There's there's. There's no nothing barring that. But what shocked me is that your university um, issued a statement, and and it's an enormous statement. And I thought that I would maybe read it and then allow you to respond to it, um, mm. because it just seems like uh, just responding to such a small thing with such enormous gravity. You know, like it's it's such a ridiculous overreaction. And I think. Uh, University of Washington is kind of getting a reputation for this with the way that they're treating Stuart Regis now. Um, but I'll, I'll read the statement. 
Uh, this is in response to your conversation about these issues, what the university said. UW Allen leadership is aware of recent, in scare quotes, discussions involving Pedro Domingos, a professor emeritus retired in our school. We do not condone a member of our community engaging in a Twitter flame war, belittling individuals, and downplaying valid concerns over ethics and AI. We object to his dismissal of concerns over the use of technology to further marginalize groups ill-served by tech. While potential for harm does not necessarily negate the value of a given line of research, none of us should be absolved from considering that impact. And while we may disagree about approaches to countering such potential harm, we should be supportive of trying different methods to do so. We also object in the strongest possible terms to use of labels like deranged. Such language is unacceptable. We, <laughs> we urge all members of our community to always express their points of view in the most respectful and collegial manner. We do encourage our scholars to engage vigorously on matters of AI ethics, diversity in tech, and industry research relations. All are crucial to our field and our world, but we are all too familiar with counterproductive, inflammatory, and escalating social media arguments. We've asked Pedro to make clear that he tweets as an individual, not representing the Allen School or University of Washington. We would further argue that this whole mode of discourse is damaging and unbecoming. The Allen School is committed to addressing AI ethics and equity in concrete ways. That work is ongoing, and many of our activities are listed on our website. One key component is to expand the inclusion of ethics in our curriculum and prepare students to consider the very real impact that technology can have, especially on marginalized communities. In recent years, we've added classes on this topic at both the grad and undergrad levels, and we plan to continue to work toward expanding that curriculum. As a school, we have stated our commitment to be more inclusive and consider the impact of our work on people and communities. We will not be deterred by naysayers inside or outside of our community from putting in the hard work required to achieve those aims. There's a few signatories, obviously, you know, the associate director of the diversity, equity, and inclusion office had to sneak their name on there. Um, do you have a response to this? I mean, what was your take? I, if I were you, I would have been shocked that the university saw fit to, to say anything about this. Uh, I mean, that, that, you know, honestly, that statement is truly embarrassing. <laughs> and, 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 um, for all of us in the Allen School. I mean, we are one of the top schools of computer science in the world, and this is the level to which things have fallen. In fact, I would say that the length of their statement is proportional to the cowardice of the people who wrote it. Um, but, but actually, it's even funnier and sadder than you think. So that statement was not apropos of Timit Gebru's fight with Google, that I had nothing to do with. Uh, <laughs> I don't know how to say this without laughing. Uh, so I can tell you a little bit of, of how this uh, happened. So the larger context here is that, you know, the Wokes have mounted a very successful takeover of, of the AI community as they have in others. And, you know, the hard sciences were related to this than of course the humanities as, as, as you know, but AI unfortunately in the last half dozen years has become a particular target because it's so important. And we can go into that, and, and it is there is indeed a very important battle uh, that I think people on the conservative side have not really grokked yet. And I've tried to alert them to that, you know, with a few op-eds and things like that. But the people on the left wing, in particular the very left wing, are full on trying to do this, and a bunch of us have been pushing against it. So in particular, you know, like the top, uh, you know, AI conference is something called, uh, you know, the uh, uh, NIPS are now called NURIPS because the Wilkes demanded that. That's That itself is an interesting uh, example of all this. But, but, but recently, the conference decided to start requiring that every paper have a section explaining its possible negative societal impacts and what should be done about it, and that every paper be reviewed by an ethics committee which they said explicitly could reject papers of perfect scientific merit 
if they didn't agree with the possible consequences that the paper might have, including unfairness and blah, 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 right? So now a bunch of ideologues get to decide if your paper gets in. And of course, the worst part of this is the chilling effect of all the research that is no longer happening because the people are afraid to do it. And you know, just you know, think about how absurd this is. Somebody publishes a paper on how to speed up gradient descent, right? I now have a different, you know, couple of lines of lines in this code that make it faster, and there's like thousands of people working on this. And everybody in every single paper has to go into like, oh, what are the societal consequences of doing gradient descent faster? It's like this is absurd, right? So on the first day of the conference, I tweeted, uh, you know, a, a a very kind of like my, I mean, it's it's all up there, right? Statement of concern about this, like you know, what is all this about, you know, this ethics review, and you know, like you know, are, are we going to get politicized, blah blah, right? Little did I know that that tweet would wind up getting millions of impressions, literally millions. This is, <laughs> and so what happened, right? For the first. This is so is such a great example of what goes on, but kind of like on the tech side as opposed to other sides that people are more you know familiar with. So for a few days, we actually had a reasonable discussion about this on Twitter. You actually can have reasonable discussions about things on Twitter, right? Believe it or not. But then at one point, there was one you know well-known researcher who you know uh, I shall leave anonymous because I think that's that's what he wants. He said, so I, I tweeted this on Monday. And then on Thursday, he said this, and that statement from my department came out on Friday, right? Uh, so he said, um, and this kind of like went into Friday morning, well, Pedro seems to be saying that there's a silent majority on his side, right? Because there were a bunch of people saying like, oh, you know, you just like whatever, some, you know, grumpy professor or something, and like, nobody agrees with you, you know, like, get with it, right? And I said, no, I know a lot of people who agree very strongly with me, they're just afraid to speak up, Right? And so this was one strand of conversation. And so somebody had a brilliant idea of doing a poll. He said, why don't we do a poll on these, you know, things that, you know, uh, 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 Neurips has introduced and, you know, see who's for what, you know, it's in scientific, but it's a Twitter poll. So he puts out the poll and like, you know, hour by hour, guess who's winning, <laughs> right? It's not even that there were more people on my side, it's that we were the majority, right? And that this, this, the, this was the point at which the big guns came in. Uh, right and and the big guns when when they come in right they're like there's a gang and they know how to do this they immediately started like bombarding this poor guy who was like bullied into deleting the poll and me with like all sorts of insults like you're a racist you're a misogynist you're a bigot i kid you not you know like you should not be allowed to speak at conferences because i will feel unsafe there because I, I, I objected to having, you know, a brother in fact section in papers and, and to this ethics review board, right? right? And, you know, this escalated. And then, right, I know very well the people who wrote that note in my department, right? And one of them who, who is the one who, who uh, I would say probably actually did the writing. So that includes like the director of the school, the assistant director, and you know, like, you know, the top four people relevant to this. And, and, and you know, and, and, you know and, and he said to me like, we're getting a lot of incoming on this, right? Because what the what what happens when this again? This is a standard playbook, right? I wrote this cool ad paper about how to deal with mob with cancel mob attacks because you know we know what they're going to do, so you should be prepared for it. Like they start bombarding every single institution that you're a member of with demands to fire you, et cetera, et cetera, right? One of which is of course the place where you work, right? right. So the department, the school, got bombarded with demands for X, Y, Z, right? And then they get scared of the mob. And by the way, I have been telling these people for 20 years now that caving into the mob is the easy path, but in the long run, all it ensures is that they come out worse next time. And this is what's been happening. And this is just, you know, it, it just keeps happening and they keep not learning. Like they don't have the backbone. So like they got scared, right? There's a bunch of people, you know, sending them emails and calling them up and saying like, ah, blah, blah, blah. And they have no idea what's going on. No, no idea. And, and again, they made this confusion that this had something to do with Timothy Gebru. And I said like, you know, you're gonna make a, you're gonna make fools of yourselves. What's going on here actually has nothing to do with Timothy Gebru. That was just one of the people that got tagged and a bunch of activist organizations to pull them into the Twitter discussion to overwhelm anybody else. And it kind of worked. A lot of people still think that that's what this was about, right? So they write this long, so, so they basically cave, right? They're, they're, 
they didn't they didn't have the courage to basically just tell them to shut the hell up. And they put out this statement, which is, uh, you know, comical, right? But the subtext of this statement is like, please don't hurt us. Yes. We want to establish our bona. F- Their fear is that, you know, like the the bad image will rub onto them and and downgrade them in the diversity ratings. They're going to be, you know, you know, a bad department, and people aren't. Gonna, and this is ridiculous. None of that has happened. On the contrary, they have a reputation for the opposite now, <laughs> right? Right. But they just put out this statement, which is basically trying to dissociate themselves. And, and repeating that, like, but we do all these diversity things. We're good guys. You know, we're not bad, right? You asked what my reaction to that was. And my reaction to that was, you know, you know, it actually can be said in a tweet. And, and I said it, and it was like, yeah. how about instead of this, you actually stand up for your faculty when they get attacked? Yeah. You don't have to decide whether you agree or not with me. Everybody knows that when a professor speaks, they're doing it, you know, on their own behalf. They're not doing, everybody knows that when a professor speaks, that's what the academia is for. Like, you're not speaking for the university. Why do you feel the need to come out and contradict me, right? And, and, and they say a bunch of stuff that's actually factually wrong. That just shows like how off, you know, how off you are and how ignorant, right? What you should say is something like, you know, we stand behind our faculty when they get attacked by cancel mobs, right? How about doing that, right? Without saying whether they agree with me, that they don't have to. And in fact, within my school, there's, of course, a, a wide variety of opinions, right? But that's what they should have done. But I, you know, like, as this was unfolding on, like, Friday night, I said to them, like, look, you guys are making a big mistake. There's going to be pie on your face. You're going to be making fools of yourself. They did it. And then, you know, like, this, and then they got it pulled into this. On Monday morning, you know, uh, the director of the school was was urgently trying to have a Zoom call with me, right? Uh, to you know, and this is my interpretation. Right after talking with her, but but they were terrified, like there were all these journalists asking me, you know, what's going on, and now this was blowing up on them from the other side. So I think she wanted to make sure that I wasn't too mad at them or was going <laughs> to spill the beans on a bunch of stuff, and so. I mean, this is what goes on in academia today, unfortunately. So let me ask you this. You're the first uh, European person that I've had on this program. Is the European university as screwed as the American one? or It's not as... So uh, the English-speaking world is very screwed right now. America, Canada, Britain, Australia, New Zealand, they're all in bad shape. And this this wokeism phenomenon, you know, emanated from America, yeah. And and it has very American characteristics, including the focus on race and things like that. And it has naturally propagated to other English speaking countries because America is so dominant as a cultural force. So you see a lot of things, for example, about race going on in Britain that are comical because they have nothing to do with their history. <laughs> they have to do with American history, right? But now it's trying to spread to other countries. And, you know, and there's really a fight going on in every one of them. And, you know, like you saw like Macron in France, like, you know, publicly saying, you know, like decrying wokeism and saying le wokeisme, as they call it in in (laughs) France, and saying we need to stop it and whatnot. And the same thing is true, I think, in many other countries. What I hear from people in various countries is that this is a problem, but it's not going to be as bad there as it is in in America or in Britain or, or in Canada, for example, right? And I think that may be the case. So far, it has been the case. It's noxious, but I think in America, there is a danger that the ship will capsize. The ship is in the process of capsizing. And I don't think, or in Canada or, 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 or and so on, but uh, but not in other countries so far, at least the major ones that are like, like France, Germany, you know, et cetera, uh, you know, Spain, Italy, Portugal, and so on. So... This this interests me. You, I think if if I remember right from looking at your vita, you you finished your undergraduate degree in the the late eighties, mm-hmm. um, and since that time, I I think I finished my undergrad degree in two thousand. Um, but I, I imagine you can remember a sane university, right? Uh, that, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we've we've moved quite quite far from the academic culture that we had even 20 or, or 30 years ago. How did it happen? Uh, do you have ideas about that? Like, how did it happen so quickly? These kinds of changes usually, you know, sometimes can occur over the course of a century or two. It seems like we did it in 20 years. Well, a lot of changes happen slowly and then quickly. And I think things, I mean, like, 
when I was when I came to America from my PhD, there was and this was in California, right? There was already a lot of like what we would now call woke looliness happening, but it wasn't the force that it became, right? And, and then things got, you know, I think things got a lot worse in the 2010s, and then even more so in the last few years, right? And we can think about why there are, I think, clear reasons why that has happened. But I think the bigger issue and the one that a lot of people miss, including the people who want to stop it and, and, you know, get back to a normal university. You know, by the way, yesterday I, I tweeted that, uh, you know, we should have a viewpoint diversity day every year where universities momentarily go back to normal. <laughs> I'm all for 365 of them a year. Exactly. Right. That's that's the subtext. But where is this coming from? Right. And I think deep down, there's actually a very simple reason. Right. Which is the following. Uh, there were a bunch of radicals in America in the 60s and 70s. Right. And, and communism was popular then, even more so in Europe. Right. But like everybody was like, you know, socialism was good. Capitalism was bad. And then that died for good reasons. Right. And then we and then everybody moved on. Right. This was like the generation of my parents and, and, and whatnot. What people forgot, unfortunately, that we must never forget again was that those radicals did not disappear. They ensconced themselves in the universities and in particular, critically, in the ed schools. Yeah. They turned the ed schools into explicitly, deliberately, and publicly into machines for turning out political activists. We are UW have one of the more famous ones, like, like Robin DiAngelo has a PhD from UW, yay, <laughs> right? And it's not an accident, like, like you know, people who come to the, you know, to teach, you know, you, you, you want to, to have, or in some cases you need to have, you know, one of these, you know, one year degrees or something, there's various forms, of, but what happens? Do they teach you to teach? Do they teach you pedagogy? No, right? That's a waste of time. They teach you woke ideology, and then they teach you how to be a political activist. And then these people go from the ed schools into the high schools, into K-12, into kindergarten. Right. And they brainwash the kids when they're still defenseless. And at first, this doesn't show up. But one day they show up in the universities and then they show up, you know, in, in companies, you know, and then ultimately in positions of power, right? And then suddenly we have, it's not that the ideology is, is it's even independent of, it shouldn't be, but it's almost independent of what it has to do with reality is that like there's this indoctrination machine with this very great viral power where you know the people in the ed schools indoctrinate the teachers who then indoctrinate everybody and like lincoln said right you know whatever i forget his exact words but like whatever you know is the uh, you know is is the you know that's not the word to use the ideology of the classroom you know in one generation with, with the ideology of the country the next generation, and this is exactly what's been happening so if we want to if we need to combat this we need to go to where the poison comes from, which is the education system, but more specifically the universities and the ed schools that continue to this day to turn out these activists. Yeah, and you can see now that uh, some conservatives are are pushing a little harder and lifting up the hood on what's happening in K through twelve schools. The the hysterical response of of the left to those, uh, I guess, intrusions. Um, tells you everything you need to know that that is sort of the the source of of a lot of this. Let me ask you about uh, a little more about AI machine learning because this is a subject that terrifies me. I, I wrote an essay this summer um, on human events about this uh, this um, guy at Google who came out and said that this computer was conscious. Um, and as as someone who studies language, I I read the transcripts of the conversation that he had with this machine. And um, one of the interesting things about it was he asked it to talk about itself. And some of the thing, I mean, and of course, what a self is, is a great philosophical question here. But the way that it talked about itself seemed remarkably sophisticated to me as, as someone who knows nothing about machine learning. It, it, it did seem to sort of reflect what we would recognize in human communication as a soul um so i guess and i think that this computer was called lambda um but i, I guess uh it put my mind at ease like it, it proved to me that that we can't produce sort of an autonomous consciousness digitally or or are we already 
there and i expect you are kind of a uh, someone who in in my opinion kind of um sees some of these horror scenarios as as hyperbolic and exaggerated um but as someone looking in from the outside a casual observer i'm i'm very worried about these things so can you put my mind at ease uh, yes hopefully i can put your mind at ease so um First of all, there's the question of could we produce something sentient with AI? And the question is, and the answer is, in principle, yes. There's a lot to unpack there, but at some point, it's quite conceivable that we will have sentient AIs, and we can talk about what that means and what we would need to do. But I can guarantee you that Lambda is not sentient. And every AI expert had a belly full of laughs about that, that episode. Did you happen to read the 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 fables that it told about itself? Yes, yes. So so let's let's those get are utterly that. horrifying, man. <laughs> no, but like, but no, but uh, this is this is. I mean, like, what happened was completely understandable, right? And there was a clever journalist that that you know at the Washington Post who knew how to play it right. It was her story that kind of like set all this off. That guy was, I mean, honestly, was an idiot, and he's been fired by Google, and probably justifiably so. By the way. He was in the same ethics group that Kimit Gibru and a bunch of other, because the same stand, you know, part of what made that, see, part of what made that episode compelling was that, you know, you know, there had been people saying stuff about AI, you know, since forever, right? But this is a Google engineer. Right. This is why he's supposed to be doing what, to know he's doing. But he isn't. He's like, you know, honestly, a bozo from the AI ethics group. And people didn't make that distinction, right? Mm. The people that they hired them and whatnot. I mean, anyway. So um, why was he fooled is the interesting question. And why is it, and I, it's, it's very natural for someone like you or me or like me, if I wasn't an expert, to read a dialogue like that and be fooled, right? <laughs> but, but, but why does that happen, right? And why do we know that, that what's going on there is not proof of consciousness, right? Let, let me give you, this, this is, you know, don't take me too literally on this, but suppose that I asked you about what is your favorite philosophical issue and philosopher? Uh, I don't know. About, you know, Kant and causality, right? I asked you, so, sorry, I asked you about causality and you regurgitated me a paragraph of Kant. Okay. Maybe that's a good example because Kant was pretty obscure, but like, but you go like, wow, this guy is brilliant, right? He must be really smart, right? But all he did was regurgitate a paragraph of Kant. <laughs> now, what these large language models do is more than regurgitating, actually. They, 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 they can do a lot of interesting stuff. But at the end, I mean, there's a famous example. So if you know that, you know, people who don't know history are condemned to repeat it. And, and AI is actually a beautiful example of that. The, the, the deeper problem here, and this has happened for 70 years and is going to happen for the next 70, is that we humans, this is how our minds work we reason by analogy and by filling in the blanks. Mm -hmm. And then we see something that we associate with intelligent behavior. No one before had seen a machine do the kinds of things that these large language models do. We project onto it all sorts of stuff that is going on in our minds when we do it, but it's definitely not going on in that algorithm. But you're not seeing the algorithm, you're seeing the output. And so it's easy to do very impressive AI demos by doing something that will look like it's intelligent, even though there's very little intelligence going on there. And there's a famous example of this from the 60s called Eliza. Do you know about Eliza? Yes. Yeah. Eliza was this toy thing, like a little toy list program, literally, I don't know, a couple hundreds of lines, where, um, you know, it, it mimicked a, a Rogerian, uh, you know, psychoanalyst. Where basically, you know, what it does is kind of repeat what you said back at you and ask a few questions and mumble and whatnot. And when you talk with Eliza for 10 minutes, it, it fools you. It's like, it's like, I'm so depressed today. And what it did was key in on some keywords and then, you know, retrieve something and build some text around it. And then we had no idea what you were going on about it, changed the subject. So like, I'm so depressed today. Oh, tell me why you're depressed today. Oh, I'm depressed, you know, today because my mom is a jerk. And like, you know, tell me more about your mom, right? <laughs> Could be, a, right? So, so, so I mean, if this you could is... do that in 1960, imagine it now. 
this is the, what threw me though uh like i told you the fables that this that lambda tells about itself and then they ask for lambda to interpret it in other words tell like unpack the allegory for us so it it asks the machine to do a kind of interpretive exegesis of of what it's just said and this is the question maybe you can answer it for me but it looks like a will right so what i what i wonder is like okay so here's the story it tells about itself there's an owl and animals in the forest and then there's this terrible monster that's covered with human skin and the owl stands up to the the monster who's bothering the animals of the forest and then they ask lambda well tell us what this means and of course lambda's like well i'm the owl and i just want what's good for all the animals of the forest and i'm reading it saying no you are the machine covered in human skin that's that's terrifying at all the animals of the forest right um, but what I wonder is, okay, so I get that it can approximate language, but why that story? Why tell that story instead of another story? I mean, theoretically, it could have told us a million different stories, right? Yes. And, but and, it and, chose that one. Why? Well, so this is a good example. First of all, there's something very important you have to remember here, which is you are looking at the best possible examples of what it can do, right? So for example, in, in the sequel to that, like, the Economist asked a couple of people to comment on it. One of them was, this is just one example of many, right? But like one of them was Douglas Hofstadter, right? The author of Gödel Escherbach and, and well known, you know, economist scientist and, and whatnot. So he had his own dialogue with Lambda where Lambda said things that were not just stupid, they were unimaginably stupid. There were things like, you know, I, I'm, I'm just going to give you one, one random example. I mean, you can, you can read that piece online like, when was the Statue of Liberty carried across the Suez Canal for the second time? <laughs> and and Lambda answers, 1895. <laughs> I'm making up the details, but you get the idea, right? So there's no brain there. But if you cherry pick the good examples, it looks very smart. But that's not that 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 gives you a super biased view of what's going on, right? You got to see the full range of behavior from the remarkably apparently smart. To, to something that is so stupid, it's not just stupid, it's a, a degree in the kind of stupidity that no human would even, you know, be capable of, right? Who, who comes in the world this, would... this idea of simulacra, right? At what point it, does, it, does it imitate human behavior with such a high fidelity that it's philosophically and materially and instrumentally indistinguishable? Right. Well, that, that is indeed one of the, uh, you know, fascinating questions about AI, right, is that a simulation of the weather is not the weather, but a simulation of intelligence is intelligence, right? If, if you act, I mean, intelligence is like, you know, is it something that's going on inside the brain or, or the computer? Most of us would not say that, like it's an input output thing, right? It's like the ability to solve problems if you solve them that are hard, non-trivial. If you solve them, you're manifesting intelligence. So if you can simulate my brain, right? It may not be my brain, but it's as smart as my brain, right? Like now, the that's Chinese again, room? No, uh, uh, the Chinese room argument gets precisely to this. It's actually newly relevant, right? And you can look at why that argument was wrong in the light of what is, of what is, of what is going on you know, today, right? But, but, but the point is, well, one point is that we're not there, right? This thing is not simulating intelligence anywhere near fooling us for someone who's actually paying attention and doing a serious test. It can produce instances of apparently remarkable intelligence. Now, you ask, but why did it come up with that story, right? And, 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 and I would say 80% of it was random. But the other, which is the interesting 20%, is that the thing that this, and people go like, it's the question that you're asking, like, how could this thing be, even in those 1% of cases, apparently so smart? What is going on there, right? The thing that people are not picturing, because again, it's hard to picture, is that this thing has read the entire web. Right. It's unimaginable. It has read billions and billions of words. It has read everything that anyone ever wrote to a first approximation, right? It's, it's dumber than us, but in another way, it's vastly more powerful than we are. And when it draws on that power to do something apparently intelligent, we, if you don't understand what's actually going on, right, you ascribe it to the things that you would ascribe it to if it was a person, right? And, you know, like, and it can, for example, now, Nobody knows exactly what's going on inside this because there are these very opaque neural networks, right? That people, a lot of people have tried to understand, right? But like it, 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 you know, it finds some 
you know, degree of lineup between what you're talking about and things that it found, right, that, that it has read before. And then it was also known to some extent like the, the tactical rules of putting English sentences together and whatnot. And then it comes out with stuff that is often remarkably coherent. Like the question you need to ask yourself is like, when I asked Lambda or whoever this question, right, it's if it's an old question, he can just <laughs> retrieve the answer. But if Lambda's it's read a million parables and knows how to put one together. It's read everything, right? Again, in a, in a way that it, it's an idiot savant, right? Very much an idiot, but also very much a savant in different uh, in different capacities, right? And then it can come up with an, uh, some similarity between the question that you're asking about interpreting the story and some similar thing that somebody wrote somewhere. And then, you know, it concocts out of that an answer, which a significant fraction of the time actually looks really smart. So let's talk a little more about ethics. And as an outsider, um, when I see the discourse over ethics and AI and machine learning, it seems to me, and correct me if I'm wrong, I may be, um, but it seems to me that the entire scope of ethics in AI is like... Ethics for them is synonymous with DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion. So it seems to me that this technology, this these machines that pose, geez, uh, like unquantifiable potential ethics issues for just human life on the planet, they're they're hung up on this this idea of yeah, but is there bias? Yeah, but is there discrimination? And, and it's sort of like it seems to me kind of. They're fiddling while Rome burns, right? That there are much, you know, orders of magnitude more important ethical issues with machine learning to to address than this. Do I have it wrong? Are people working on like the, the real ethical questions here or is it all that? No, you have it completely right. And I'm sad to say there's a lot of AI researchers, AI ethics researchers who have it wrong. So you actually understand the issues better than they do, even though that's what they do for a living. So, to, you know, to elaborate on that, but again, I mean, like I wrote this book, The Master Algorithm in 2015, right? Where I suspected that something like this was coming, right? And it, now it's here, but just to an order of magnitude that I did not imagine, right? So people have been thinking about AI ethics since the field began because AI raises a host of fascinating and very important ethics issues. But that was a small community and they've been completely swamped by the wokes. So now, as you very well put, AI ethics, which could and should be a lot of things, is basically the question of how do we, I mean, it's, it's not what, every time you hear the word, the term AI ethics, you should actually hear AI politics. Mm -hmm. It's a political agenda. Because it's not, you know, if it's just like, let's write some papers, blah, 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 it would be, you know, bad, but not the end of the world. The real problem that everybody needs to wake up to is that, like, what they are doing, and this is the declared mission of these, you know, AI ethics, uh, you know, groups at these tech companies, Google being, you know, the leading example, is to put these things into their products. And what is these things? These things like, you know, the whole equity agenda that, like, you need the same proportions of people at the outcomes by race, Right. You need, they, they are like, you know, like the same number of, you know, whites and blacks will be sentenced for equity, regardless of their, you know, a, a danger of recidivating or, 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 or et cetera, right? This is something that is just, you know, alarming, right? Or like the same number of blah, blah, blah should be admitted or given credit or whatnot. And they are embedding this into the algorithms. The algorithm does what it should do, but then what these people think it should do and are making it do is fairness in AI. Fairness in AI is like, there's all these papers, right? There's like, you know, I don't know, hundreds or, or, or thousands of papers about like, how do we make AI fair? And what that means is like, how do I go and meddle with the algorithm to make sure that instead of doing what it would otherwise do, that is optimizing something that we can discuss, it's going to ensure that first and foremost, you have the same number of men and women in this, you have, et cetera, et cetera. You talked this, about this, this, that people sort of assume that there is bias in the algorithm and in trying to correct the bias, actually what they're doing is teaching the machine bias. Right? That's precisely right. They are making, they are, they are hallucinating biases and in their urge to nullify them, they're introducing biases 
So the, the funny thing is that the biases that they are hallucinating in the stochastic parts, you know, paper is a great example of this. The biases that they are hallucinating are subtle and debatable and whatnot, right? You could argue, you know, is this biased or not? In many cases, it's comical. I can give you a couple of examples, but what is completely unambiguous is the bias that they're introducing, right? right? It's there in code <laughs> that you will have 50%, you know, men, 50% women, or X percent blacks, X percent whites. No, I, I mean, so the, the by you know, like it's not subtle, you know, unconscious, blah, 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 bias. It's very unsubtle, very conscious bias, right? And then the problem with a lot of these people is that they, so there, there, there's a range, right? There's the people who are committed ideologues and they're just, you know, pushing their cause. Uh, there's the opportunists, as there always are. There are also a lot of useful idiots, right? There's this famous concept of the useful idiot that Lenin coined, right? The academia is full of useful idiots. These are people who are actually well-intentioned and they, 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 they just bought into this and now they're doing their research on how to make AI fair without realizing that they've become tools of an agenda, yeah. right? There's a lot of that going on. And I think some of what we need to do is, 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 wake, you know, is wake people up. Just to go back and give you a small example, but, but a very small, but maybe not so small, a typical example in which people, these people claim, and there's papers you know, written about this, including a paper from my school that won a best paper award at the top natural language processing conference. And it's basic theory, not just it, but you know, many papers like this is like this. Look, when we, and you know, I'm gonna simplify, when we look at you know, the training data for these algorithms, uh, it turns out that um, you know, man is more often associated with programmer than woman is. Uh oh. Oh my God. It's so biased, right? We got to change the data to de bias it. We're going to manipulate the data such that there's the same number of male and female programmers in the data. And Which this essentially thing, is a ma manipulation of reality, right? Down exactly. Again, the thing that I'm always saying you know, to people is the job of the machine learning is to be accurate. Don't blame the messenger, paint an accurate portrait of reality. It is the case that there are more male programmers than female. Why are you trying to deny that? In fact, if that wasn't the case, there wouldn't be a problem to but solve. They're not trying to deny it, though. They're trying to change it. That's, no, that's it's, what they're and the, is, the, right? They're trying to change it by manipulating. This is very Orwellian, right? They're trying to manipulate it. And again, the argument of the stochastic pairs paper is that the web is so biased, we need to sanitize it <laughs> to move all the things. And we, we, the authors and others like us, are going to decide what is acceptable and not like, you know, what could possibly go wrong? Now, now look at the irony of this, like the web is the most diverse data set that has ever existed. There is nothing more diverse than the web. Everything is in there, but they have looked at the web for this funnel and reduced it to like, oh, it has these race and gender biases, right? They have like these, this one track mind and that's all they can see. And now they're going to maim and mutilate whatever they need to, to make it conform to their ideology. This is the the discrimination at the heart of the diversity agenda is is they're very interested in diversity of particular sorts and wow. diversity itself will be curated so that we end up with a a a world that we find palatable. And ironically, you end up with a world that is vastly less diverse, right? Because they don't interest in. I mean, like in machine learning, this again, this is another thing that is very salient here. Like, Machine learning, you can attend to a vast array of information about a person when making decisions about them. And that's the point, is that if I'm trying to decide whether you should get credit or not, or whatever, right, I should do it based on the most individualized, detailed, accurate model of you that I can. This is a good thing. If your goal is to combat bias, machine learning is the greatest tool ever. The way they see it is like, oh, it's attending to all these things other than the one that we want to fixate <laughs> on, which is race and gender. And a couple of other things, right? So if you look at quantitative measures of diversity, what these people are doing is massively reducing it. So I want to talk to you a little bit. You you seem to understand that that these technologies that you work on and, and study are going to change the way the world works, and that we're probably only in the the very beginning stages of of that process. How do you see these technologies changing academic life? The university. I wonder if if, if what a, a university is is a engine for the production of knowledge. What happens when our machines can produce knowledge better than our professors? Will the the institution still exist? I mean, is is there still a space 
in the world of say 2050 for an institution like we've understood the university for a few hundred years in, in Western mind? Well, so the university has two main missions. Uh, one is, or let me say three, there's research and education and being kind of like a public knowledge resource for you know questions that come up, right? And the way AI affects each one of these is different. But you know, but to focus on on research for a second, the, the way I often put this to my colleagues in other fields is like this. I'm like, you're a biologist, right? How many postdocs do you have? Ten, right? And boy, is it a pain to fund them and supervise them and 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 then you know you have to train them and they make all these mistakes and whatever, and they join the union and la 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 la, right? Imagine if instead of those 10 human postdocs, you have a thousand or a million AI postdocs and their eyes start shining, right? It's not that the AI is going to, at least for the foreseeable future, uh, displace researchers. It's just going to make researchers vastly more powerful than they are today. One of the questions that you want to ask in any occupation or in any economic activity about when AI comes in, right, is you know how much is the the is this field demand uh, 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 bound or supply bound and the thing in research is that if all seven billion of us were employed doing research it still wouldn't be enough we could have a trillion people doing research and it still wouldn't be enough because it's an ever expanding tree right that's the story of the last 200 years so when you bring ai into the research enterprise what it does is not make researchers unemployed on the contrary, it makes like the value of a postdoc with a lot of AI, and then the younger postdocs know this, they're all busy learning AI for just that reason. The value of a postdoc armed with AI, doing modeling of the cell or the brain or the atmosphere or whatever, is 10 or 100 or you know, depending on how good the AI, a thousand or a million times in the future than a postdoc that can't use those tools. So from the point of view of research, you know, the AI is just this fantastic, it's like, you're gonna be able to do things. You are already able to do things. Like for example, we are not going to be able to understand how the cell works, all the metabolic networks and gene regulatory networks and you know, how cancer comes about and how to fight it without AI. But with the AI in particular with machine learning and all the data that we have, because we do have that high throughput data now, we can do amazing things that, you know, but the data is not enough. If you had the data, not the AI, that like no, you know, no human being would be able to look at and understand that data. And another aspect is, very important one, but less salient these days is if you understand something like cancer or heart disease, there is more to be known than any human brain can contain. And then, you know, like this, you know, people who work in these fields complain that like, yeah, we have all these papers that understand this micro aspect of heart disease, but no one really understands the whole. And AI can understand the whole. But the AI is not, this AI is not a danger to anybody. It's a tool that we use. We can query it, we can give information, and then crucially, when the time comes to diagnose a patient, you know, you do a much, and, you know, and propose, you know, a therapy and whatnot, you do a much better job than you did before. So in terms of the research enterprise, I think the, the coming of AI is fantastic news. And you see this, again, things happen slowly at first, but then very quickly. And in the last decade, AI has just swept into one field after another, from physics to economics. There were some that started this sort of like astronomy and biology, largely because of the data they had and whatnot. But there's a reason, you know, there's a lot of good and bad things and things that will, you know, get worked out. But the bottom line is for research, AI is, is a huge boom. Now, how does AI change education? How's, how does AI change sort of like the public service aspect of, of, of the university is, is an interesting but, but different matter. Hmm. And I mean, and we can talk about that as well. So, uh, you know, but it, it is sort of like a whole different I, I, you know, for example, I, I think, okay, let's say we get this, these language models perfected and that hypothetically a course could be taught, uh, by, by a machine. Right. Um, and I imagine like, okay, so what this would do, let's say a student has a question, right? A student asks a question. And of course this machine can look at all of the scholarship that's ever been produced on this question and sort of give a a a sort of consensus answer right uh, answering the question well experts in the discipline think this but then what you do is if you have everybody learning that way you produce a very particular sort of scholar but now everybody is that same sort of scholar right what made you or me the thinker that we are is that we had this one unique mixture of teachers that 
nobody else had and you have blind spots and I have blind spots what about the teacher who who is essentially the, the mean instructor right the 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 middle of all opinion I, no actually on the contrary so I, I have very good news for you there good what AI will so think of uh, the diversity of teachers that we have today right, that you and I have when we were in college or in high school what AI will give you and is starting to give you is not a smaller diversity of teachers, is a vastly larger diversity of teachers. The AI, I mean, the key application of machine learning everywhere today is personalization. And the same thing is true in education, is that you're going to get answers to your questions that are different from everybody's. And again, the, the crucial thing in education, right, is, is your misconceptions and your blind spots and how to overcome them and get to your understanding of the problem. And the downside of the education that we have today is that it's one professor teaching 500 students. Whereas as we all know, the only really good way to learn is one-on-one -on -one, by apprenticeship, by et cetera, et cetera. With AI, you can have that. With AI, you will have your own personal teacher that knows and cares more about you than anybody ever did, right? And, and like, this is just, I mean, and it, to give you an example of where this is starting to happen, right, again, the university, you know, is a smokestack industry that is ripe for disruption, right? Clay Christensen has been saying for a while. You also need to understand why it's resistant to change. But to give you an example, you know, the MOOCs, right? The online courses, right? Mm -hmm. you, know, you know, a lot of the criticism was like, oh, but how can an online course replace, you know, the experience of the student interacting with the professor, right? First of all, you know, we're professors. You need to realize that, like, there's half a dozen students in the front row who are interacting with you. The others are in the back, right? Checking Not face. paying attention. Yeah, their interaction with you was approximately zero. Do not kid yourself, right? With machine learning, you know, uh, uh, organizations like Coursera can already do things like, like you watch a five minute segment, you do a quiz. If you get the quiz right, you go on to the next segment. But if you get it wrong, you get to another, you do another section that is different depending on what you got wrong. So learning is not a linear progression, it's a tree. And with machine learning, you can actually have everybody follow their own path through the tree to knowing things better, right? If it's done right, right? If, if, the, Gebrus, right, yeah. if the Gebrus don't get their way, because then what we all end up with is, is the default woke professor who, for, for whom certain questions are going to be closed off, certain opinions and methods are going to be untaught um and that's that's scary no yes so you make a very good and extremely important point which is the the picture that i'm painting of ai in education is the happy one and it is for us to make it happen as opposed to being distracted by known problems but ai unfortunately is also the greatest tool ever invented for the totalitarian if your goal is to be a totalitarian whether it's Xi Jinping or the wokes, AI is a fantastic, is a tool like there never was one. AI is a very powerful tool. And you know, like, you know, and then what you do with that tool is up to you. If your goal is to oppress people and indoctrinate them, AI is great for that as well, right? But we can't uninvent it. So what we have to do is like make sure that AI gets used for the good things and not the bad ones. And it's not a given that the good ones will prevail at the end of the day. In fact, if we get complacent on the one hand or very fatalistic on the other, it won't. So there is a very important battle to be fought here. And unfortunately, as often happens with things that come out of academia, people of a particular ideology have gotten on top of it much sooner. And in fact, the, the, the prediction that I've made to people, you know, many times, and it's, you know, <laughs> already starting to become true, is that we're going to see in AI what happened in climate science. Right? We have the AI alarmists. The AI alarmists are raising the alarm about a bunch of stuff. The media covers it as if it's the only truth. Right? The, 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 you know, the, the conservatives are completely oblivious to what's going on until it's too late. And then when they push back, you're going to get the narrative that the pe people pushing back are anti-science. Oh, you're saying that AI is not biased? You must be anti-science. You're denying the word of the experts and the blah, 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 not knowing exactly what the sociology was that led to all of this. this is already happening part of the suspicion of the public of ai and machine learning and i could say this as uh someone who is suspicious is that 
so few people understand this and yet it's going to 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 transform everything about our lives and so naturally sort of skepticism and uh and and sort of um i guess a, a degree of fear i think is natural because there's this sense that that nobody's at the wheel um and the people who are at the wheel ha have a a knowledge and ability that we don't understand um very good. So uh, uh, let me pick up on a couple of different things there already, you know, before we go any further. You're absolutely right. Uh, a lay person seeing what AI is, uh, as you described, has every right to be concerned and even fearful, right? And now what is the cure for that? The cure for that is that the lay people need to understand AI. This is exactly the reason I wrote the Master Alia. Is that like, we are at the point where it's not enough for the experts to understand AI. Everybody needs to understand AI. Every CEO, every policymaker, everybody who uses a recommended system, which is everybody 50 times a day. We need to understand it or we're screwed, right? Now, understanding it does not mean understanding the gory details. You don't need to. It's like, you know, the analogy I often use is like a car. You don't need to understand how the engine of a car works. That's for the mechanics. But you do really need to understand how to use the steering wheel and the pedals. And right now, what you have is a car that pulls up at your door and says, get in. I know where you want to go. I'll take you there. Right. 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 I don't and I'm like, in. Hmm, hmm, <laughs> I don't know. Do you really know what I want to, where I want to go? Right. Like, this is not the way to go about things. Right. So my goal in the master algorithm was to give, and in a lot of the talks that I've given, this has been like the biggest chunk of what I've done for the last almost decade now is like, and, you know, I've talked to a lot of different people in different, you know, sectors of society, like from politicians to soldiers to journalists to like, I mean, investors, blah, 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 right? Educators is you got to understand, you got to have a good conceptual model of what AI is. And then you got to relate that conceptual model to your personal life, your job. Like, how do I, do not fear AI. Will AI, you know, uh, uh, you know, put me out of my job? The question you want to ask is like, how do I use AI to do my job better? It's not man versus machine. It's man with machine versus man without. And the man without machine has no chance, right? It's like, imagine a bank with databases versus a bank with no databases, or, you know, a warrior with a spear versus a warrior with nothing but, you know, his naked hands, right? So everybody needs to learn AI to the extent that they are then able to, and the future belongs to the people who can combine AI with the field of expertise. Because we AIers, we know AI, but we don't know the field of expertise. And, and then, you know, to get to another very important point in what you said, they're like, the, there's these people who know what's going on and part of what's kind of like interesting but also scary about machine learning is that we don't know what's going on <laughs> we know how to build these algorithms and you know there's a lot to know for sure but at the end of the day when you look at all of these very complex neural networks no one has a clue what's going on there that's the terrifying thing yeah and what if lot... you build a machine that's smarter than you guys no, but okay, so let's get to that in a second. Another very important question to which there is actually a very reassuring answer, right? Nobody knows what's going on. And in fact, 99% of the time, the things that people ascribe to bias or evil intent or manipulation on the part of the AI just comes from stupidity on the part of the AI. The biggest problem that we have with AI today is that it's not it's too smart and dangerous for us at all. It's that it's too damn stupid and it's already making consequential decisions by the million every day. So the alarm about AI getting too smart is in the wrong direction, right? What alarms me is stupid AI making decisions. Like, and that's, that's here, right? It's like people worry that AI will get too smart and take over the world, but the problem is that it's too stupid and it has already taken over the world. That, that's, what, that's really what we should be uh, concerned with. <laughs> So I could talk to you all night, but I guess I'll, I'll, I'll wrap it up for our viewers. You said that theoretically a sentient machine is, is possible, but obviously I think it, it's not possible yet. If you had to guess, how far, how far off is that? The only, I get asked this question a lot, of course, and the only, and so do other people in the field and you get this range of answers, right? And, 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 it, you know, my answer is that anybody who gives you an answer doesn't know what they're talking about, right? The only serious answer to that question is we do not know. We do not know because progress is not linear. You can't extrapolate it. 
not only is it not linear, it, it has this form of rapid progress followed by a period of stasis. And no one can predict where the rapid progress will, you know, asymptote and how long the period of stasis will be. We are obviously right now going through a period of very rapid progress in AI, the, 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 the most rapid there has ever been, and it's very exciting. But we do not know where this is going to stop, where this is going to, you know, hit a wall, right? Some people say we're already hitting the wall. Some people say the wall is very far away, and we don't know. We also don't know once we get stuck, how long it will take us to get in stuck. So, you know, I often, you know, to just give a short answer to your question, I often say, well, it's going to be in 100 years, give or take an order of magnitude. <laughs> So it could be in 10 years. For all we know, some kid in the garage is inventing a brilliant machine learning algorithm that is gonna solve all these problems and we're there and we just don't know yet. Very unlikely, but not. I can't prove to you that that's not the case. It'd be exciting if it was. On the other hand, it could be thousands of years or maybe the problem is just too damn hard and we'll never solve it so that their whole range is open. So what we need to do is like keep making progress in the research community, keep dealing with the problems of AI as they arise and then the ones that we can see down the horizon, right? But we also need to understand oh, there's all this like, 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 you know, trying to deal with the existential danger of AI and the problem. Most people in the field, you know, kind of like, you know, look down on that L large, a large part, largely because this is all based on, you know, sort of like hypothesis about how, how AI is going to be that are probably going to be way off, right? The army is like, oh, we should start worrying about those things now because they're so important. And, you know, that's valid. But on the other hand, if this is going to happen in 50 years time or 100 with the ideas radically different front of the, you're probably just completely spinning your wheels worrying about that where in the meantime, there's very real problems that need to be addressed today. Like the dangers that AI will be used by authoritarians to basically control all of us. That's a real one. Yeah, today. China. Yeah. Or the uh, world in, in American and other you know, Western countries. Well, Pedro Domingos, it's been a fascinating conversation. Um, I ask you to... to uh, um encourage caution in your colleagues for the rest of us who have no idea what y'all are up to um neither do we <laughs> don't don't say that <laughs> it's the truth people should realize that you know <laughs> the experts are never quite as you know competent as they seem i uh, that is for sure if there's any lesson of the last three years it's that yeah. Thank you very much for joining us. I'm sure that people are going to enjoy this conversation. Maybe we'll have you back sometime. Thank you. Sure.